As a CNA, you are part of a larger care team. You play an important and unique role in infection control and prevention. We have previously discussed how to identify infectious diseases, so let's talk about prevention. Remember, from the previous submodule, we discussed the chain of infection. The chain of infection starts with the infectious agent, continues to the source, finds its way back into the environment through the portal of exit, passes from potential host to host during the transmission phase, and then enters and infects a new host, and the process continues. There is a lot you can do as a CNA to break the chain of infection. Let's examine precaution levels and weak points within the chain. How to best break the chain depends on the level of precaution. The level of precaution is directly related to the nature of the infectious agent, but the general hierarchy of precautions looks like this. The first level of precaution refers to the standard of care. This initial level of precaution requires proper hand hygiene, use of situation-specific PPE, limiting the shared use of equipment, and isolating potential cases when possible. Transmission-based precautions were written to protect residents and staff. As a CNA, you will have significant physical contact with your patients, so it is very important to understand the precaution levels for each individual patient. Transmission-based precautions are disease-specific and broken into three categories, contact, droplet, and airborne precautions. The patient's chart should note the precaution level, and you should always check the chart before starting rounds. You should also make sure to get the report from the previous CNA because it can include changes in a patient's condition, such as now having an infectious disease. Different settings use different charting software, such as Epic, Athena, Chartpad, etc. Pay attention to the reason for admission and equip yourself with proper PPE. You can put a barrier between the portal of exit and transmission by using PPE. PPE may seem uncomfortable and inconvenient, but properly worn PPE protects you and your family against the spread of infection. Failure to wear proper PPE increases the likelihood that you will carry the infectious agent out of the patient's room and into your personal life. Following PPE protocols is important not only for health and safety, but PPE protocol violations can result in hefty fines for individuals and the facility and termination of employment. PPE protocols should be posted on the patient doors, but when in doubt, check the patient's charts or ask your supervisor. Do not walk into a patient room without first knowing what precautions to take. Masks are an essential part of PPE and need to be specially fitted to your face. When not wearing a mask, use respiratory etiquette. Respiratory etiquette means covering your mouth and nose when you sneeze and cough and wearing appropriate masks. You may need different masks for different situations. Respiratory etiquette also includes staying home when you are sick to prevent the spread of infectious droplets in the air and wearing a mask if you are sick and working. Proper hand hygiene is one of the most effective ways to prevent the transmission of infection. Follow the posted hand washing protocols. The posted protocols include the length of time required to clean hands, the cleaning solution needed, and the frequency between hand washings. As a general rule, you need to wash your hands between each patient, but there will be times when you need to wash your hands more often. Wearing gloves is not an excuse to skip hand washing. Not all hand washing methods are effective against all sources of infection. In some cases, alcohol-based hand sanitizers are ineffective in killing the infectious agent. Ask your supervisor if you have any questions about using alcohol-based sanitizers with specific patients. Finally, make sure your hands are clean when touching your face, mouth, and any wounds, abrasions, or breaks in the skin. Waste disposal is everyone's duty. Contaminated waste can lead to contamination of food and beverages and result in the further spread of infection. You should understand the waste removal protocols and follow them. Something like folding linens in the correct way helps limit your contact to infectious agents. Properly clean any instrument that touches a patient. In some cases, you may have access to patient-specific equipment. For example, a TB patient may have a set of instruments in their negative pressure room. This reduces the likelihood of spreading infection throughout the hospital. 
patient-specific equipment is not always a practical solution, and in those cases, keep disinfecting materials close by so that you can carefully clean each item that comes in contact with patients. Some infections, including skin and GI infections, are easily transmitted person to person via contaminated items. Cleaning all items before you return home greatly reduces the chances of you taking infectious agents home to your loved ones. Personal hygiene slows the spread of infectious disease. Your clothing may pick up infectious agents as you work. Removing these contaminated items immediately after work can help reduce the infections present in your home. Showering also takes away another layer of possible infection. If you cannot change your clothes or shower, consider washing your hands thoroughly before preparing food or physically interacting with family members. Illnesses, like MRSA, can be easily spread to family members by contaminated clothing, but can be removed relatively easily with laundry detergent. Simple yet effective infection prevention strategies keep you and your patients healthy. And importantly, prevention methods keep you from bringing infections home.